welcome to Blackstone Intelligence with your host, Jake Morphonios. Thank you for tuning in to the Blackstone Intelligence Report podcast. Today is Friday, January 15th, 2021. I'm your host, Jake Morphonios. Let's jump right into the latest geopolitical news. Back during the U.S. presidential primaries, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced that he was going to annex a large part of the territory in the Palestinian West Bank. The world's leaders recognized that the disappearance of a vast amount of Palestinian uh, Palestinian territory would not be a good thing. It would eliminate any hope of Palestinian statehood. It would eliminate the possibility of the two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Candidates who were competing to win the Democratic nomination during the primaries each came out with their own various statements about their attitudes toward the annexation. Some of the candidates, including uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg and uh, Bernie Sanders, they said that the annexation must be opposed and that continued U.S. financial welfare payments to Israel should be withheld if Israel went forward with this total annexation of the West Bank. Now, candidate Joe Biden was one of those Democrats who disagreed. He said that U.S. aid to Israel should not be conditioned on whether or not Israel steals Palestinian land. In more recent months, Benjamin Netanyahu has had backed off those plans, at least publicly, because of the Abraham Accords with the Arab Gulf states and uh, trying to back off a little bit for their sake. But this week, Netanyahu, under pressure from hardline Zionists and the right-wing settler faction in Israel, uh, who want him to move forward with these annexation plans, well, Netanyahu announced on Monday his approval for construction to go forward on new Jewish settlements in the West Bank, and not a small number of uh, new projects. This will include 800 more homes in the West Bank. Of course, this is an incredibly provocative act. It's not only a complete violation of the promises that Israel had just made in their so-called peace accords with the Gulf states, but it's also a shot across the bow of the new Biden administration. Uh, Knowing that the Trump administration is not going to push back against this, Netanyahu has effectively signaled to Joe Biden who does support the two-state solution, that Israel is going to move full steam ahead without regard for what Biden thinks on the matter. Uh, This provocative move by Netanyahu also suggests that Israel pretty much intends to completely abandon any attempts at peace with the Palestinians and that they will likely soon return to these efforts for full and total annexation of the West Bank. One reason for Netanyahu's aggressive push is that Israel is now going through its fourth election in just under two years. And he is being challenged by, uh, Netanyahu is being challenged by candidates who are even further to the right than he is. And so Netanyahu is throwing some raw meat to the land ravenous settlers who want to continue this rapid expansion into Palestinian territory to try and stave off, you know, the the political challenge coming from his right. But as a result, the incoming Joe Biden is now having to reconsider his position that he took during the primaries. Because if Biden does not implement consequences for this uh, outrageously bad behavior by Israel, if he doesn't stand up to Israel early in his administration, His diplomatic team at the U.S. State Department can expect to see Israel engage in further bold and provocative moves on matters such as Iran, uh, in Syria, the Iranian nuclear deal, and things like that. And this is not the first time that Netanyahu has done something like this to Biden. Back in 2010, when he was still vice president, Biden uh, made a diplomatic trip to Israel only to be blindsided when he arrived with this strategically planned announcement that Israel was going to dramatically expand its settlement building, something they knew that Biden opposed and and the Obama administration opposed. And Biden came out and said as much. He said that he firmly objected to uh, these new settlement plans 
because they undermine uh, the peace process. But this time around may be a little different because Biden is not the vice president. He is the president. And with this new position comes much greater authority to put some teeth behind these objections that he has raised. But we do know that Joe Biden is a, a Zionist. He's said that many times. So we're just going to have to wait to see what kind of response Biden is going to implement in response to this latest settlement construction, if he has any response at all, which who knows he may not. But what I want to do is take a few minutes to dive back into history uh, and talk to you guys about settlement building. I want to share a short lesson on how all of this started. If we go way back, the lands of the what we call today the West Bank were known in Bible times as, uh, as Samaria. In 70 AD, Rome went in and expelled the last remnants of the Jews from this, this whole region, from Palestine, including Samaria. Centuries later, in 640 AD, Arabs came in and took possession of the land, and they have lived in Palestine continuously for the last 1300 years. According to a demographic study that was published back in 2001, the name of it is Population Change and Political Transitions, Demography in Israel-Palestine. As of the year 1800, the Arab population in Palestine was uh, 268,000 people. The Jewish population was 7,000. So in other words, about 3%, just under 3% of the people who lived in Palestine as of 1800 were Jews. According to the Journal of uh, Historical Geography, and I looked this up in Volume 19, Issue 2, uh, and, and this is also confirmed in many other academic and mainstream sources, toward the end of the 1800s, there was a wealthy banker named Baron Edmund de Rothschild who began pouring massive amounts of money into an effort to relocate European Jews to Palestine. Edmund was the grandson of the Rothschild family patriarch, Meyer Amschel Rothschild. Meyer Amschel, if you don't know the story, he sent his five sons into different European cities to establish branches of the powerful Rothschild bank. He sent his son James to Paris, where he established the French branch of the bank. Uh, so Meyer Amschel, the father of James, who was the father of Edmund, who was the guy we're talking about here. Seeing the lucrative potential of Palestinian resources, Baron Edmund began buying up land in Palestine in 1882, and he financed the relocation of European Jews to those properties. He built vineyards, he built wineries, he started other businesses, and he soon found that he was going to need a lot more manpower if he was going to support further economic ventures there in Palestine. So he teamed up with the Zionist movement. This is a new movement. Uh, and he used Zionism to settle as many European Jews into Palestine as possible. Uh, resettling European Jews into Palestine was not the originally how it was done. In the 1890s, for example, <clears throat> Edmund co-opted an organization that was called the Jewish Colonization Association, the JCA, co-opted it for his own purposes. If you go to the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, uh, the entry on the JCA, it, it clearly states that the JCA had originally been dedicated to relocating Jews from Russia and from Romania, not to Palestine, but to Argentina in South America. However, after the death of the JCA's founder, who was a Bavarian noble named Baron de Hirsch, Edmund decided to repurpose the organization. And rather than continuing to relocate Jews to Argentina, he started to move them to his properties that he was building there in Palestine. And most of the people who uh, arrived there went to work for Rothschild businesses. Uh, 
Uh, and Edmund later changed the name of the Jewish Colonization Association to the Palestine Jewish Colonization Association. Through this organization, uh, Edmund purchased another 125,000 acres of land, and he invested in several more business ventures. He created, uh, for example, a bottle factory to produce the bottles that he needed for his wineries. He financed farms. He poured money into electric generating stations uh, and, and other ventures that expanded his financial position. And along the way, Edmund continued to finance Jewish settlements to support these business ventures. It's estimated that Baron Edmund uh, invested more than $50 million to support relocation and settlement building, uh, which was at that time a massive, massive amount of money. But despite this resettlement effort, Jews continued to remain the clear minority uh, up through the turn of the century. The demographic study that I referenced just a few minutes ago uh, states that as of 1914, the population of Palestine was 86% Arab compared to 13.5% Jewish. Now, with these changing demographics, Edward was determined that this, this burgeoning Jewish minority would hold political power over the, the Arab majority that vastly outnumbered them. Uh, if, if you go to the biography of Judah L. Magnus, which was written by author Daniel Coatson, we read that in 1931, uh, Baron Edmund Rothschild wrote to this fellow, Judah Magnus, and he told him this, quote, we must hold the Arabs down with a strong hand. I do want to note, though, that despite Edmund's attitude, during this time period, Arabs and Jews were still living together in peace. There was very little animosity between them. They made good neighbors. They even tended one another's children uh, when they went to work. You know, they got along. Now, Edmund died in 1934, and, uh, you know, he's naturally seen as a hero among the Israeli people. His contributions to the Jewish people were widely recognized uh, in various forms. Uh, for example, for a, a period of years, his own portrait appeared on the 500 shekel note issued by the Bank of Israel. Uh, you've got Israeli buildings named after him, malls named after him, parks and streets such as Tel Aviv's Rothschild Boulevard. These were named after him because of the monumental role that he played in moving the, the Jews of Europe into Palestine. Naturally, the native Arab Palestinians are not as fond of Edmund Rothschild, though. Uh, this, this settlement movement that Rothschild started continued to bring a flood of new immigrants from Europe into the land at a breathtaking pace. Uh, and these new settlers expanded far beyond the properties that had been purchased by Edmund. And the settlers began to encroach onto Palestinian lands, uh, lands to which they had no legal entitlement. Uh, a lot of people are flowing in. And uh, so, for example, from 1929 to 1939 alone, 300,000 Jewish colonizers arrived in Palestine from Europe. So, as you can imagine, this rapid influx of, of Europeans led to disputes with the locals over access to natural resources, disputes over land ownership, access to religious sites such as the uh, the, the Wailing Wall, uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and so forth, violence soon became common. And there were atrocities being committed by both sides against the other. But the violence took a, a marked escalation, uh, a, a dramatic ex escalation, with the introduction of Jewish militias and terrorist groups. And this is... Um, confirmed all over the place, even in, in Jewish, hist, uh, Jewish historians acknowledge uh, they call some of these groups terrorist groups. Um, according to Vox senior correspondent uh, Zach Beauchamp, here's what he wrote, quote, the Zionist militia Ergun, 
bombed the King David Hotel in 1946. The Irgun also bombed arid Arab populated buses, markets, and population centers. And he added that these terrorist attacks were intended, at least in part, to drive out the British. This is during the British mandate period. Drive out the British so that the Jewish colonizers could, quote, secure Jewish control over the land. So terrorism was used to establish uh, control. Now, there's a reason that these colonialists had to resort to terrorism to secure that control over the land. It's because the native landowners were not willing to sell their land to the Europeans who were trying to colonize. By 1947, the year before the state of Israel was established, the native Arabs continued to be the majority. There were 1.2 million Arabs in Palestine. But because of the Jewish settlement programs, their numbers had dramatically increased to roughly half of what the Arab population was. There was about 630,000 Jews as of 1947. But despite these vastly increasing numbers of Jews, they still had only acquired 5% of the land they were living on through legal land purchases. So the attitude of these colonizers was that if the native population was unwilling to turn their land over, to sell it to them uh, willingly, well, the land would have to be taken by force. In 1948, the Jews declared their independence and immediately launched this massive bloody attack against the native Palestinians uh, who own the land. And in just a few months, the Israeli forces, including a number of terrorist militias like Urgun, drove Palestinians out of more than 500 towns and villages, and they claimed the land for the state of Israel. But what this did is it created 700,000 homeless Palestinian refugees. The Palestinians refer to this ethnic cleansing as the Nakba, or the catastrophe. Now, if we look at today's conditions, there are one and a half million Palestinians uh, who are currently living in squalid conditions throughout these refugee camps uh, in the surrounding areas, such as in Jordan and Lebanon and southern Syria, as well as in the Palestine uh, area, uh, including the Gaza Strip, the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Since the founding of Israel in 1948, the Palestinian people have maintained that they have the right to return to their homes. This is a right that is denied by Israel, though. Over the decades since the founding of Israel, the Jewish state has continued to not only stop the Palestinians from regaining the stolen land, but they continue to eat away at the remaining lands that are under Palestinian control. And the largest section of this uh, territory is the West Bank. The goal of the uh, early Zionists was uh, purportedly to establish a homeland for the Jews that was safe, where they could all live together. But that has changed. The modern Zionist movement is uh, not just looking for a homeland for the Jews. The modern Zionist movement seeks to dispossess the native popula population of these remaining Palestinian lands and to build Jewish settlements on top of those lands. Because if you do that, you can form a, a kind of adverse possession and claim it as your own because no Palestinians have lived on it for a certain period of time. And of course, the way that you keep this propped up is you send in the Israeli military and the uh, security forces to keep Palestinians from being able to get their land back. I spent some time over there in the West Bank uh, and I visited a bunch of these cities, Janine, Nablus, Hebron, Bethlehem, Ramallah. And while I was there, I also visited some of the refugee camps. I saw, I observed the deplorable conditions with my own eyes. I listened to the Palestinians describe their plight with my own ears. The humanitarian disaster in Palestine that has resulted from this illegal Israeli occupation is absolutely untenable. And the people of conscience, not just in Palestine, but around the world, have the right 
to object to the ongoing subjugation of the Palestinians by Israel. Fortunately, there are many Jews who strongly object to the occupation and abuse of the Palestinians. I'm friends with some of them. I belong to a couple of their organizations. Unfortunately, those Jews are mostly a progressive minority or Palestinians uh, or Jews living still in, in uh, the United States or elsewhere. They are a minority that are relatively powerless against the hardline majority in Israel that does support the ongoing occupation and land theft. The fact is that unless sufficient outside pressure is levied against Israel, unless the outside world comes to the aid of the Palestinian people, uh, Israel is probably not going to change their ways. That change is probably never going to come. And so that's why I support, uh, as do thousands and thousands and thousands of people around the world, a nonviolent campaign called BDS that pressures Israel to begin respecting the rights of the Palestinians. And, they, and the campaign achieves this or seeks to achieve it by three ways. First, individuals can boycott Israeli products, especially those that are being produced in these illegal Jewish settlements. Uh, second, companies and institutions can divest, which means they can withdraw their investments from Israel and its institutions. And thirdly, governments can place economic sanctions on Israel until Israel chooses to withdraw its illegal settlements and return stolen lands back to the rightful owners uh, until they end their illegal military occupation and allow families living in exile in, in refugee camps to return to their homes. And this is something that uh, the Biden administration will have to look at. I don't believe that, uh, that the Biden administration would come out with a full on economic sanction against Israel, but even withholding funding from Israel uh, over settlement building, that's, that, uh, that's something. It's better than nothing. Uh, so at the same time, let me just speak to the other issue. We have to recognize the reality of the situation. There are millions of Jews living in Israel today, and they're not going to go away. They, they, they live there. Despite the displacement of the Palestinian people, we have to also recognize that one wrong does not justify another. The Jews that live in Israel are human beings just like everyone else. They have the same hopes and dreams as anyone living anywhere else. They have people they love. They should be able to live in peace without the fear of random rocket attacks uh, or terrorist bombings of buses and ice cream parlors. The solution to this is Israel-Palestine conflict is not going to be resolved with bloodshed. Palestinians absolutely have the right to defend themselves when they are attacked. They have the right to stand up and defend their property from theft. They have a right to organize a resistance against aggressive abuse by this brutal Israeli military and security forces. And it is severe, the abuse that is committed against the Palestinians by Israeli forces. But it is a fallacy for the militant extremist factions in Palestine to believe that they are somehow going to force all of the Jews from the land through bloodshed or terror. So the Palestinian people, in order to keep the international community on their side, they must be swift to speak out against these extremists that live among them. Violence is not the answer. Fortunately, as I interviewed dozens and dozens of Palestinians myself, I heard, and I can tell they're genuine, violence isn't their goal. Eradication of Israel is not their objective. What they want is for Israel to stop taking their land. They want Israel to end the illegal, uh, illegal occupation and let them live in peace. The Palestinians want to live in peace as neighbors with the Jews, with equal rights under the law. But what they are not willing to do, what they cannot do, is tolerate the indignity of living as a subjected people. 
I do believe that Jews and Palestinians can live in peace together. They did it for 1300 years. They lived together in peace. But relations are never going to be peaceful. They will never be normalized as long as one side has their boot on the throat of the other. And if you think this doesn't matter to you, it does. This conflict has far ranging ramifications. What happens in the Middle East sends ripples throughout the world. It affects all of us in one way or another. So I pray for peace and brotherly love between Arabs and Jews in the Holy Land. And today I'd like to invite you to do the same. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you spending a few minutes with me today for Blackstone Intelligence. I'm Jake Morfonios. If you appreciate hard-hitting investigative journalism that you won't get from the mainstream media, then please support Jake's research and analysis at patreon.com forward slash endtimesnewsreport, paypal.me forward slash endtimesnewsreport, or send a check or money order to Jake Morfonios, P.O. Box 1333, Kernersville, North Carolina 27285.